something. Uh, for our leadership conference, you know, we deal with spiritual leadership, business leadership. We deal with every aspect of leadership in our leadership conference. And uh, Wally Adeyemo is a name that you may or may not know, but he is the Deputy Secretary of the United States Treasury, is going to be our guest. And I'm so happy to announce him being there. <laughs> Deputy Secretary Adeyemo served as the Treasury Department's number two official and chief operating officer in the world and has taken a leading role in Treasury's National Secretary, I mean in the nation, uh, National Secretary Economic Inequality and Pandemic Related Economic Recovery Works. He's a bad brother. I've talked to him. I've spent some time with him. He has a wealth of knowledge. He also worked up under the Obama administration. He's currently serving our country right now, and he's going to be a part of the International Leadership Summit. Clap your hands and give God praise. We're going to study the Word of God together. We're going to get into the Word of God together, and we're going to discuss the Word of God together out of the Gospel of St. John, chapter 4, verse 20 through 28. Yeah, somebody's been reading out of John. Amen. John 4, 20 through 28. We're coming in uh, at an odd point of delivery in this discussion between Jesus and the woman at the well. Most of the discussion I have omitted because it is not relevant to the point that I really want to make. But I want you to join me in the 20th verse, knowing that the conversation is well underway. For the most part, we have omitted her personal life, her tragedies, her struggles, her issues, and we have left them in the solitude of her own confession with Jesus. We are focused more as the conversation is starting to pivot toward what Jesus is going to do through her. Yeah. yeah. Am I at the potter's house? Yeah. Good to be home. Yeah. <laughs> Our fathers worshiped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, watch this closely, woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers, the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. Now, if you read this as a Christian, you don't understand how radical that statement is. But if you read that as an Orthodox Jew, you would understand how revolutionary it was for Jesus not only to condemn them worshiping in the mountain of Gerizim, but also to offer up that the hour cometh and now is that neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem she shall ye worship God. God is a spirit, verse 24. God is a spirit. God is a spirit. God is not a philosophy. God is not an ideology. God is a spirit. Uh, God is not a thing. Uh, God is not the creation. Uh, God is a spirit. God is not the universe. God is a spirit. God is a spirit. God is a spirit. You can't bind him. You can't hold him. God is a spirit. Nobody elected him. Nobody can disavow him. God is a spirit. Yeah. 
and they that worship him must worship him in spirit not in a mountain not in a temple in spirit and in truth the woman saith unto him I know that the Messiah cometh which is called Christ when he is come he will tell us all things Jesus saith unto her I that speak unto thee am he This is a Bible-loving church. And upon this came, now here come the disciples after everything's over. Upon this came his disciples and marveled and marveled and they were shocked that he talked with the woman. Wonder why. Yet no man said, what seekest thou? Or why talkest thou with her? The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith to the men, come see a man. Can you say amen? amen. I want to talk for a few moments from the subject, the radical rabbi. The radical rabbi. Rabbi, simply senior teacher. The radical Rabbi, Spirit of the living God, trinkle down upon us. Descend upon us like dew in the morning. Moisten our hard hearts, our callous dispositions, our indifferent attitudes, that we might be so ingratiated by you to enter into the integrity of this text. I thank you for what you're going to do. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated in his presence. <laughs> there is a word from the Lord. I think sometimes our Western culture has damaged our perception of who Jesus is and how he operated. Through our cinematic productions and perhaps some of our artwork and our depictions and our Sunday school uh, illustrations of Jesus, he comes across as being rather genteel, and meek, and humble, and quiet, almost passive, if you will. But the truth of the matter is, Jesus was not always gentle. He could be confrontational. He could be outspoken. He called them a generation of vipers, a whole generation of snakes. He told the Pharisees that they were like dead men's bones. He, was right. he went in the church and knocked over the tables kick things and move things. Jesus was radical. While we labor to fit in, we serve a God who stood out. He did not ingratiate himself with the Pharisees or try to get in with the Sadducees or be a part of the Sanhedrin. Jesus was radical. Though he announced his ministry in the temple, he didn't stay in the temple wrestling with them over orthodoxy, but he took it to the streets. He went into the highways and the byways and the alleys and touched the untouchable and the least likely in his ministry because he was a radical rabbi. So radical that Nicodemus sought him by night saying, I know that thou art a teacher, a master, a rabbi sent from God, and I want to know about this thing you keep talking about being born again. Jesus was radical. He went to the wine bibbers. 
He hung out with sinners. You're, you're, you're much holier than Jesus. Because the church today disqualifies you if they see you with a sinner, but they worship a God who hung around sinners. And the sinners followed Jesus. And the sinners washed his feet. And the sinners came to know God through him. And the religious people all criticized him because he was radical. Anytime you are different, you will be controversial. And because some of us have always wanted to fit in so bad, we have never been our authentic self because we need validation from people. We compromise our revelation for validation so that we can fit in with the Pharisees or the Sadducees or the family picnic or the family reunion or the class reunion or the sorority. Anything can become a clique, a club, and anything will challenge you to have the courage to be radical. Now, looking at this text, we have two ways that we can look at it. We can look at it through a microscope and focus in on the woman at the well and how she comes down to the well to meet Jesus. And we can get food and nourishment from her story because all of us are in some way thirsty. And so we identify readily with the woman at the well and we can zoom in our lens to the specificity of her predicament where she didn't, perhaps did not get along with other women or perhaps did not come down to a particular hour or time, or perhaps she was used to dealing with men who said flirtatious things to her. All of us have had to deal with something at some time that made us want to be alone with our thirst. I'd rather be thirsty by myself than have water from an enemy. We could take the microscope and hone in on the particulars of their conversation and argue over who was the most thirsty, the woman or Jesus, because it was not the woman who mentions thirst first, it was Jesus who said, give me to drink. But we don't have time to do that. I, my, my assignment is not to be microscopic. I want to go a little bit deeper than a microscope to a telescope and back up from the text. Because it is only when you take the telescope and back away from a situation that you understand why you are in the situation. Sometimes you are too close up on the problem to understand the why of the problem and it's only when you take a uh, telescope and back away from it. That's why most of us don't understand what we're going through till after we get through it. In retrospect, your life makes a lot more sense than it does in real time while you're dealing with it. Because when you're dealing with it, you're feeling with it. And, oh, y'all didn't hear me. That was good. When you're dealing with it, you're feeling with it. And the feelings stop your telescope and bring you down to a microscopic perspective of you hurt me. And at that level, we don't understand why we are in the season that we are in. And ain't this a season? <laughs> Now, the people who know, know what I'm talking about. Isn't this a season where you don't know from day to day what you're going to have to deal with from moment to moment? You don't know. It's a season 
that if you are microscopic and not telescopic in how you look at it, you are micro instead of macro, you can't get perspective and you will think that God is not there. This woman believed in the Messiah and didn't recognize the Messiah, though she was talking to the Messiah, which says it's possible for God to be there and you not perceive him as God in the middle of the situation. Uh, her religiosity embraces the idea that the Messiah is coming and she does not realize because she is so micro that she is talking to the Messiah while she is waiting on the Messiah until he said, I that speak and he. You see, Jesus is the seed of Abraham. And we know this. And we write it in songs and we put it in music, but we don't understand what the power of what that means. It not only means that he is the seed that passed through Abraham's dead loins and quickened Sarah's barren womb and caused her to conceive Isaac and passed down through really over 42 generations and came forth and says, I am the seed of Abraham. He is also the promise of Abraham. That through thy seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed. Now, yes, that's telescopic. Through, through thy seed shall all nations. But you see, they weren't ready for Jesus to deal with all nations. They wanted him to be king of the Jews. Much like denominations today, if you don't go to our church, you're not in the real church. If you don't do it like we do it, then I call you a false prophet. If you don't say it like I said, see, the Jews wanted to franchise the seed of Abraham, but the prophecy said, through thy seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed. And while they were wrestling with when will you set up your kingdom, Jesus says, I must need go through Samaria. And it's kind of shocking. Because the Samaritans and the Jews did not get along. And they have a long history of not getting along. They were originally closely related they all trace back to the Israelites. However, over time, a rift developed in history before Jesus comes now. A rift developed between them that has gone on for centuries. You can get in a fight with somebody and be in a fight so long, you can't even remember why you fight them. Which means that if you were in a fight generationally, if your mama doesn't like them. My wife always says you can tell what people really think about you by how their kids treat you. Now I've had no dealing with the kid, but the kid already is dishing me and acting funny because they heard mama say something about you that has caused them to have a certain opinion and perspective about you. So a lot of what we think and feel and believe about things is passed down to us. Oh, y'all ain't gonna talk to me this morning. In fact, a lot of the foods you don't like you don't like them because you weren't exposed to them. And some of you are so micro in your thinking that if mama didn't cook it without even tasting it, I don't like it. So sometimes you have to trace things back from a telescopic perspective and back all the way out of it and say, how come I don't like how come I don't go? How come I've got an attitude and start to separate what was cast on you 
from what is really you. Your idea, I don't have time to play with this, Lord. Don't, don't do me like this in front of people. Your ideas about marriage and what a husband ought to be and what a wife ought to be was passed on you. Either based on what you saw or didn't see, liked or didn't like, you play a role and expect me to play a part in a movie where I never read the script you read. I ain't gonna bother that. Let me go back to the Samaritans. Y'all like it better when I talk about other people. <laughs> so in, in 722 BC, the Assyrians attacked the northern tribes of Israel and dispersed them and scattered them and moved into their territory and even began to marry them and affected them and eventually it affected them in several different ways. They became new in their ideas because when you, when you, when you start intermarrying, you, you become, the longer my wife and I have been married, the more we change places. She used to be the introvert. <laughs> but after 40 some years, I'm starting to be a little more introverted because association What's your mama tell you about association? Association brings on assimilation. So the new settlers intermarried with the remaining Israelites, leading to the development of new ideas, a distinct group of people that became the Samaritans. The Samaritans and the Jews are related in their origin, but different in their experiences. When you are related in your origin and different in your experiences, you bring those differences to bear issue with each other and we do not focus on what unites us. We focus on what divides us and we become identified by our differences. The Samaritans accepted only the first five books of the Hebrew Bible, the Pentateuch, the rest of it they did not believe in. The Jews recognized the entire Hebrew Bible, both oral and written, and recognized them as sacred. But the Samaritans did not. But they both believed in God. They both believed in the Messiah. They both believed that the Messiah was coming in. They both were waiting on him. One on Mount Gerizim, and one waiting on him to come through the eastern gate. They're both waiting in two different places. And they're fighting about where he's coming. <laughs> we have fought about everything in the world you can think of to fight about. Natural hair. <laughs> weaves. Stilettos, tennis shoes. I'm liberated, I'm not wearing heels no more. We, we have fought about everything. I'm natural, I don't wear makeup. She got on all that makeup, she's prettier with that. We have fought about light skin, dark skin. Democrat, left wing, we have fought about everything you can think of to fight about. I'm a southerner. I don't eat southern cooking. I like Mexican food. I don't like any other. We fought about food. We fought about everything. That such, it was, such were the times, only more severely. The difference between the Jews and Samaritans, I want to illustrate it this way. It would be like me going to a Klan meeting. I knew if I used that illustration, it would really drive the point home. So I want to I, I want to use it because we're both Americans. We're both in the South. We both believe in Jesus. But we got a long history that it would shock my pastors if I said I'm gonna run a revival at a Klan's meeting. 
When Jesus said, I must need go to Samaria, it was that shocking. Now you're with me. Uh -huh. I see the heads nod now. Now you see the power of the text. See, when you're reading the Bible, you're reading it backwards. You're reading it after it happened without putting it in the context of the times in which it happened. So you read the facts, but you miss the intensity of the feeling of the moment. Why were the disciples shocked that he was talking to this woman? It's the same way you would be if you saw me hanging out with the clan. And I would say, well, they believe in Jesus. And they're Americans, and we both got passports. But the differences have become more important than the similarities. I'm just in my introduction. I'm not going to make it. Lord, help me, Jesus. The Samaritans have built their own temple because even down through history, when they tried, to join the Jews in building a temple they were forbidden. They were mad because the Jews had shut them out. They said, we'll build our own temple. We'll build it up on the mountaintop. We'll serve God our way. And the Jews said, the holiest site in Israel is in Jerusalem in the synagogue. And they were fighting about that. So they are historically fighting they are culturally fighting. They are fighting about everything imaginable, including politics. And right in the middle of it, Jesus says, I'm going to go down to the well and go to Samaria. The Jews have returned to Judah and rebuilt the temple. Why is Jesus going down to Samaria because he's radical. He's radical. He's radical enough to go where you're not supposed to. To do what you're not supposed to do. <laughs> to be your own person. To stand on your own two feet. What is the good of being free? If Jesus sets you free, why would you let people bind you up? I want to declare somebody free today. I don't know who it is, but I want to cut somebody loose today. I want to break some chains off of somebody in the room today. I want some authenticity to come out of you if don't nobody like you but God. I want you to come to the point that you can stand up and be yourself and stand in the power of what God is saying to you. Shake hands with somebody and say, I want you to like me, but you don't have to. Oh, something's about to happen in here. I got to be careful because I'm going to start a revolution in here. I don't want to mess up and start a riot in here. I cannot afford to let the way you think incarcerate the way I live. I've got to do me. See, one of the things, let me, let me, let me just say this. I, I didn't even mean to say this, but one of the things that I take issue with is Jesus gave the keys to the kingdom to Peter, but he never gave anybody the keys to hell. So how do you get to send me to hell? Oh, y'all not gonna talk back to me today. <clears throat> Jesus is radical. To go to Samaria, period, was radical. And to sit down by the well and wait on a woman in a misogynic society 
for the Messiah to wait on a woman. Come on, sisters. You know I'm keeping it real for you up in here. You know, you know how people do. You know how men have subtle ways of dishing you without dishing you and putting you in a second class place. You work with it every day. You live with it every day. They, they will look past you and talk to your husband like you're invisible because you know what you go through as a woman. There's a woman coming down to the well. And Jesus, who only has three years, is running out of time, and he's waiting on her. And she's a Samaritan. You have to have courage to be different. If you're different in any way, and you go to this church, you have to have courage. Because some of your friends say, why are you going over there to that potter's house? I thought that was a black church. You have to be your own person and say, my soul is getting blessed at the potter's house and the blessing don't come in colors. That's why when you see Mexican folks, white folks, German folks coming to the house of God, any kind of people that don't look like you, you ought to go out of your way to be kind to them because anytime you dare to be different, you got to climb over something somebody thought about what you said. Somebody holler, I'm here! I want to point out to you that God doesn't do anything by accident. He sends the disciples away for food he didn't eat. He wants them out of the way so that they don't bring their prejudiced ideas into this moment of miracles if you read the text, it doesn't make sense. He sent them away to get food, and when they brought the food back, he said, I have meat you know not of, which means I was just getting you out of the way so that I can break down some barriers and touch somebody that you don't like because sometimes God blesses people you don't like. Touch three people and say, something's about to happen in here this morning. Something's about to happen, something's about to happen, something's about to happen, something's about to happen. I feel it, I feel it in the room. Something is about to happen, something is about to happen, something is about to happen. Something is about to be shattered. Some tradition is about to be shattered. Orthodoxy is about to be shattered. God's about to do a new thing in you. God's about to stir up something in you and everybody can't handle it. Some folk you need to send to go get lunch so you can do what God called you to do. If Jesus is the seed of Abraham, then through thy seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed. Doesn't just mean the nations you like. He has a passion for the Samaritans. Let me prove it to you. When the Pharisees ask him, you say love thy neighbor, who is my neighbor? That's when Jesus gave them the story of the good. To say the good Samaritan is like saying the good clan member. 
Oh, you feeling some kind of way now. You feeling some kind of way now. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, in the dark. <laughs> oh, God. I wish I was back preaching in the days of so, one social media. I would go all the way there with you and go completely off. Because there are people that you don't like that you don't know. And you will go off like you know them. I don't like Oprah. Truth is, <laughs> when was the last time you had some coffee with Oprah? But we will develop a narrative and be angry and emotional about somebody we have never met. So all of you that can't grow with me, go get some lunch. Don't mean I don't love you. Don't mean we're not gonna get back together. But for what I got to do at this moment, I know you can't handle this. You, you go get some lunch. And you can come back when it's over and ask questions. That's why the Bible said they marveled why he was speaking to this woman. They didn't marvel when he spoke to the woman caught in the act of adultery. See, people have selective grace. If you fit the profile, I'll give you grace. But if you don't fit the profile, when Jesus talks to the woman and he starts a narrative with her that is reflective of the good Samaritan. Do you know how the Pharisees felt when he said the good Samaritan and he says the Levite passed by, saw the man bleeding on the Jericho road and offered no aid to him? I, come on, somebody. He says, but when the good Samaritan came, he got down off his beast and put the man on his beast. He wrapped up his wounds and poured in oil and wine. Sometimes God will use people to bless you that do not fit the narrative of your expectation. And you bring them to the family reunion and your grandmama is rolling her eyes, talking about, well, come on in. And you gotta have enough courage to know what you know while they grow. Their theology was different and off. Their politics were different. They had generational differences. And they had a mutual disdain for each other. But Jesus is trying to get them to open their mind. Have you ever tried to open a bottle and no matter how you squeezed it, you couldn't open it? It's embarrassing as a man because we're supposed to be able to open anything and your, and your woman is looking at you, you know, so you put a little pressure down on it and you try. That's the way it is trying to open up people's minds. You, 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 you're trying to get them to open their mind, but I'm, I'm breaking generational curses that were imposed upon you, that you were born into, that you were exposed to, and sometimes you gotta put some pressure on it to get it to turn, which is what repentance means. Repentance does not mean to come slobber on the altar and cry about something you did. Repentance, metatonio in the Greek, means to change the way you think. Can I go deeper? Am I helping somebody in this room? While they have focused on what is different about them, I want to focus on what is common about them. Whether you are a Jew or a Samaritan, you still need water. 
The human body is composed of roughly 60% water. So water needs water. If you don't get water, you don't irrigate your organs, your tissue, your brain health is compromised, your joints are not lubricated, the vitality of your brain is diminished because you need water. That's why she's coming to the well. That's why he's sitting at the well talking about, give me to drink. He has asked this woman, can I go deep for y'all? He, he noticed that Jesus asked the woman for water before she has any. So stop telling me that God will only ask you for something you have. God will ask you for something you haven't even drawn from yet. There is a call on your life that you haven't even dropped your buckets into the well to see who you really are. And God will ask you for something that you don't think is in your inventory. Who's ready to get the water you don't even have? He will ask you to be a leader and you've never led before. He will ask you to be a preacher and you don't like to talk in front of people. I spent two years arguing with God about my ministry. I said, please just get somebody else. This is not gonna go good. I'm a bad choice. Leave me alone. I'm honored, I'm flattered. Thank you, see you. I don't even want to be that. And look, for almost 50 years, I, my whole life's destiny has been built around something I was trying to fight off. Who else in this room has a call on your life that you are trying to fight off because you don't feel qualified or it's not you or you know how people are and you don't want to be bothered with it and yet God keeps drawing you saying, I thirst. I thir how come you are asking me for water? I just got to the well myself. My buckets are dry. My buckets are dry. Oh, Shanda Bukesha. My storage is empty. I'm depleted. I'm in need myself. You ask me for water? Why, why don't you have your own bucket? That's what they're talking about. You, you know you thirsty, you should have brought something yourself. I'm thirsty too. What draws them together, the Samaritan and the Jewish rabbi, is water. As long as he is in the flesh, he's thirsty too. It reminds me of the statement he makes while he's dying on the cross, saying, I thirst. The God in him is not thirsty. The man in him is thirsty. The God in him is living water. The God in him is an artesian well springing up to everlasting life. It is the man in him that is thirsty. It is possible to be divinely anointed and still be humanly Oh, y'all don't know that. Y'all don't know that. You no, know, you phone is gone and get some lunch. I'll take a Big Mac with some fries and a Coke. See you later. God bless you. Happy Sunday. As anointed as you are, you still thirsty. As well as you can sing, 
you still thirsty. As talented as you are, you're still thirsty. As educated as you are, you're still thirsty. And Jesus is radical enough to meet her at the point of her thirst. If you're watching right now online, I don't care how thirsty you are, how lonely you are, how shocked you were, he walked out the door, left you with the bill and the kids, you're holding the pillow and crying at night. God is laying beside you, got the other pillow, he's right up against you. Somebody holla out thirst! Thirst brought her down to the well. And he knew that sooner or later, she gonna show up. When you get through talking in tongues, when you get through dancing all over the church, when you get through being deep and spiritual and judging everybody else and putting people in and putting people out and sending folk to hell, sooner or later, you're going to come down to this well and I'm going to be waiting on you when you get there and I'm going to show you yourself. <laughs> Let me hear it. <laughs> I didn't mess around and feel like preaching now. Y'all should have stopped me about 20 minutes ago before I felt this anointing creep up the back of my spine and hit me in the center of my cranium. And I feel the power of the Holy Ghost. Power! Power, love! Holy Ghost and power! I feel the power. If you're watching from Lake Nona, this is what I'm talking about, this part right here. I love oh, oh, yeah. I need a drink. <laughs> I need a drink. I walked all the way down here because I'm thirsty and I'm dry and I'm tired and I'm lonely. Give me this water that I thirst not. Need to come here. I'm tired of coming here. the same old stuff. I'm tired. Give me this water that I thirst not. I'm going to give you 15 minutes, 15 seconds to give God a crazy praise. Praise him till you feel the water. Praise him till he quits your thirst. Praise him till he meets your need. Three people tell I gotta get this water. I gotta get this water. I can't come to church and cross my legs and look cute. I gotta get this water. For the devil I'm fighting, I gotta get this water. For the trouble I gotta deal with, I gotta get this water. For the thing I'm going through, I gotta get this water. If I don't get this water, if I don't get this water.
he says to her, your people worship in the mountain, you know not what. You just going through routines. You just going through rituals. You just come to church. You, you, you just doing something to be doing. So y'all don't know, y'all don't even know what you're doing. But I waited on you. You've been burning sage. But I waited on you. You've been reading your astrology sign. But I waited on you. You've been tied up in your sexual mess. But I waited on you. And I know you can't shout because you don't want to break your cover. But when you get back to the house, give him a praise on your front porch for how God I need a shouting deacon. I need a shouting evangelist. I need a shouting church mother that said if it had not been. Can I go old school on you? Tell you neighbor, you don't know like I know what he's done for me. You don't know like I know what he's done for me. I know, I know what he's done for me. I know, I know what he's done for me. I, I know, I know. I feel a praise about to break out in this place. It's about to get stupid in here. The power of God is about to move. That thing you feel running up and down your spine. God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship him. As long as he was rebuking, the Samaritans, he was acting like a regular rabbi. Y'all don't know what you're doing, worshiping up in the mountain, it gears them. You don't know what you're doing, you don't know how to worship, you don't know. Salvation is of the Jews, we know who we worship, that's, that's good stuff. But when he said, the hour cometh, and now is, how can it be coming and now is? Good God Almighty, the eternal everlasting God. Don't pay no attention to a clock. He said it's already here and it's going to hit you in a minute. Oh. Slap your neighbor and say it's about to hit you because it's already here.
for me to get off of that. It's coming and it's here. The hour cometh and now he is. The day that worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth. Neither shall you worship in this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Oh, what, 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 what? Rabbi, you, 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 you have brought the worship in Jerusalem down to the worship at the Mount of Gerizim? Yeah, because it's coming and it's here. 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 here. Of Reformation, we're the only way to worship God. It's not about places. It's about in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. As I close, I want you to see one woman comes down to meet one rabbi and one well to get one walk because God only needs one. When God got ready to make humanity, he made one man. And out of that one man came one woman. And out of that one woman came all of creation. God always uses one. When Israel was in bondage for 400 years, God didn't send an angel. God didn't send no disciples. He sent one man named Moses to go down there and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. When God got ready to bring a people out of a people, he used one man named Abram. And when God 
elect got ready to deliver the world from their sins. He used one man, for there is but one Lord and one faith and one baptism. Slap somebody and say, I'm the one. I'm the one. That's what the fight is about. I'm the one. That's what the tears are about. I'm the one. That's what the test is about. I'm the one. The woman at the well was the one to carry the message to the city. Come see a man that told me all things I have ever done. If you flip over to Acts chapter 8, Philip was in Jerusalem and the great persecution arose in Jerusalem. And the Bible said Philip went down to Samaria by himself, one man. You got too many folk around you. All you need is one. If God be for you, he's more than the world against you. Who am I preaching to? Who am I preaching to? Who's here to get this word? You can stand all by yourself. The power of one is exemplified. Yes, there were other people crucified before him and after him. There were other people crucified around him, but they were not the one. When you are the one, she was the one to plant it. Philip was the one to water it because God in his telescopic view of humanities was bigger than the king of the Jews. He is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. And God is bigger than the box and the connotations that you place him in. And that's why I call him the radical rabbi.